She-Hulk writer Cody Ziegler says his residual check is three hundred and ninety-six dollars. He wrote the episode with Daredevil's return. Yeah, that's that's about accurate for a residual check for streaming. I mean, I can tell you that Adam ruins everything. We made for the smallest channel on basic cable. The first year that those episodes aired, I would receive a check for twenty thousand dollars, which was you know like for for writing twenty episodes of television, sixteen episodes of television a year was like a, a great bonus to be able to pay my rent, you know. And and uh, other writers, every writer on the show received that same amount. I know writers who like you know used that to pay their rent between jobs. Um, when I made the G word for Netflix. Um, that show, uh, my total residual payment for the first six episodes was five hundred dollars for the first year. Um, huh. And so we're talking literally, you know, one percent of what we were earning in the past. And again, you know, twenty thousand dollars for work I, I did is like, you know, might sound like a lot to some people. Except that again, we go a long time between jobs, and the, the companies are making so much money off of our work. And this is money that writers have counted on for decades and decades. That is like a fundamental part of our compensation. It's it's like it's, it's not like oh some super sweet bonus. It's like no, this is how you make your year. This yeah. is just how you pay your mortgage. I mean, the celebrity shit in the actor strike is like a real other dimension because like Fran Drescher, the president of SAG-AFTRA, got shit for like going and working for Dolce & Gabbana like during the negotiations, right? When she had a pre-existing gig. Now, I also have pre-existing gigs during our strike. I'm doing, I'm on tour doing stand-up. If you want to come see me in Buffalo, Baltimore, uh, uh, St. Louis, or Providence, Rhode Island, go to adamconover.net for tickets. You can come see me do stand-up. I can do that during the strike, right? Fran Drescher, while in negotiation, she has a pre-existing commitment to. The union leadership roles are unpaid, right? I don't really have a problem with her going and like doing a gig if she's still doing a good job as a union president. But she got so much hate because people love to hate on celebrities. People want to find the excuse to talk shit about her. And that's uh, that's the dynamic. It's still going Did you to... talk about the thing in Deadline where they said they were trying to make us all homeless? Did you read that article? Yeah, I did. Okay, good. Because um, that shit was wild and was such a miscalculation <laughs> by the studios. It like caused a, a surge of donations to the entertainment community fund because the public was so pissed off about this. The previous version of this tweet was deleted for lacking Damon's full statement in the copy. We regret the inaccuracy and apologize to Mr. Damon. Someone's PR agent went fucking nuts on them. That's yeah. wild to see in Deadline. Yeah, because they made him look like he was anti the, the union action yeah. when he wasn't. Yeah, that's even though he is, you know, he is Mr. NFT. I mean, Dead Deadline is the piece of, is the shittiest of all the trades. Hollywood Reporter is the one that I like the best because they employ two reporters named Katie Kilkenny and Gary Baum, who are very good reporters who get labor. Like, they, I, I don't agree with everything they write, but they generally understand labor very well. Deadline is just like a fucking uh, slush pile, and they just they just love creating chaos. And some good people work there, uh, and you know we got to deal with them. But like, if you read something about a labor action in Deadline, do not. Not believe it before you go all screw these elite actors 87 percent of current union members don't even make 26 a year and of that 13 percent, many are background actors yeah. which are which is just more consistent yeah 87 percent of union members don't qualify for health insurance yeah it's, it, I, it, I have it, friends who some of them were child actors for example and and you know they're very successful and now they have to like sometimes appear in production specifically so they can maintain their health insurance yeah i mean i i do that too like they you know there's a lot of gigs where i go like hey can uh, you know, can you make this SAG? Uh, I, I'd say that routinely, but the main reason I do is like, oh, maybe I can make the health insurance minimum because my writer's good health insurance is about to run out. SAG after health, health insurance, not quite as good, but if I can like make 26K, I can uh, uh, have insurance for a little bit. Yeah, which is why Adam is going to be on the next rendition of Sound of Freedom, Sound of Freedom 2. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess this must be a union movie uh, if it's being released theatrically. Uh, oh, yeah. And so uh, that's that's one thing that I love is that, like, our union coverage is so good that even, like, the right-wing fucks need to deal with our unions um, in order to get anything made. I think even, like, I think we were talking about this uh, in union circles that, like, the Daily Wires movies are also union. Uh, <laughs> Wait, really? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Oh, no way. I think so. For I... a whole $800 that Gina Carano's uh, movie made, they... <laughs> They still went with a union crew. Could That's look it awesome. up. Well, you, you know, like IATSE, the crew union is a tough union. If you try to shoot something non-union, they just fucking flip you. They show up with signs and they're like, you're flipped. You're flipped now. And then, you know, SAG is like, it's really hard to get actors who, who are any good who are not SAG. Oh, uh, there's also the worker strike with uh, hotels. Unite Here is back out. They are fucking badasses. Um, they're yeah. on our line all the time. We join them on their picket line. They represent like some of the lowest paid, you know, immigrant workers in Los Angeles. And they are so powerful. 
powerful. And they're doing a really cool strategy right now. They're doing citywide strikes, but they're doing them, they're like surprise strikes. They did a strike for a weekend and then they called it off. And now they're doing it again at, a, at some other hotels. And I believe their strategy is to like create chaos and uncertainty because, you know, their workers are like low wage. And so I think they're going to have trouble waiting out a long strike, but they're like, we can disrupt your business whenever we fucking want, like at the drop of a hat because our people are so organized. And so that's their strategy to try to get increases for their members. It's really fucking cool. They're an incredible union. They're doing the same thing with HBO. This seems to be a clear message from Warner Bros. House of Dragon has a lot of SAG members. How can they do this? No, they don't. I mean, with their British actors, they're saying most of the cast are UK actors working under contracts governed by the local union equity and are not legally allowed to strike. UK has really shitty labor laws. Um, like, we cannot picket in the UK. It's like the picketing restrictions are really limited. Yeah, you have to, like, what do you, what do you have to get it on a calendar ahead of time, too? There's a lot it's of like stuff weird. like that. It's, a really, it's limited in the US, too, but it's a lot more limited in the UK. And, um, yeah, I mean, if those actors are not SAG members at all, then, you know, they're not bound by the strike. But, uh, I mean, they're going to be shooting around the ones who are SAG members. And so, at the very least, it's going to be a problem for them. Well, they also don't have writers. They can't have yeah. the American writers that are a part of the Correct. Writers Guild are not doing any rewrites, so it's yeah. going to be shit. And ideally, the showrunners of shows like this are just walking off of the shows. And then there's nobody running them. They have to have a non-writing producer. And, like, if they have somebody, like, try to make little line changes or edits that person is violating the contract and like it's a whole enforcement issue and you can't enforce every single show but if we're able to like end or disrupt 70 or 80 percent of the productions like it ha it makes a huge makes a huge huge difference you know the the ceos are really gonna right now they're going okay we'll be fine we'll be, we could we could shoot we could shoot house of the dragon and ask how they feel in a week you know once they see how much stuff is being shot shut down how much money they're losing how badly they're doing in the press they're gonna start freaking out very shortly adam's right they've shot around SAG members for weeks running triple bank main units to get rid of them before the strike. Wow, you Glacier Rays, you got the inside you got the inside scoop. The, In the UK that is. Yeah, they've shot around SAG members for weeks running triple banked main units to get rid of them before the strike. So they're trying to shoot out all the SAG members. But it doesn't you <laughs> I mean, maybe they were able to do it. But, there's yeah. always going to be reshoots. There's always right? going to be reshoots. Um, you work in film and TV in the UK. There's always going to be reshoots, and there's yeah. always going to be like rewrites too. Yeah. Which both of which, if you don't have your show, is going to be shit. Yep. The people are going to need to come back in to do ADR, which is when they dub in the audio. Look, every single one of these shows has a line producer, and the line producer's job is to make the show happen no matter what. And so those people are so driven. And whenever a strike is called, they start doing shit like this, where they start bargaining. About, okay, if we just shoot out the people. Uh, Maybe I can still, because that's their fucking job. They're, and, and, you know, respect to them for doing a good job. Like that show Wonder Man that we, you know, shut down on the Marvel show, they kept trying to shoot for like two weeks until they finally gave up um, because we were just shutting them down every single day and they were hemorrhaging money. And so there's a lot of bargaining that they do to, with themselves to try to figure out how to, how to keep it going, but it, it doesn't work in the long run. You cannot make television and movies without uh, SAG-AFTRA and Writers Guild members. It doesn't work. That's why we're going to win. How long would you estimate it takes before the studio's pockets start bleeding seriously, Adam? Not you, Hassan, you're dumb. <laughs> I think... Well, well, first of all, they're already bleeding. They're already hemorrhaging money from the shows that were shut down. They are already uh, not going to have shows for the fall lineup for the ones that still have broadcast networks like Fox and NBC and, and CBS, Paramount, etc. And, uh, you know, the, any disruption to these companies costs money. So, like I said, Fox, having to adjust everything, put up a strike-proof lineup, but now that strike-proof lineup can't shoot either, that's going to cost them a lot of money. And so what we're doing is fucking up their pipeline. In the future, like when they look ahead of the next two years they're also like you know they need their their earnings those years as well and they're not going to be having those shows or movies so, and, so again and also the media does play a role in this in my opinion because look the reality is when you shut off production and you eliminate the runway the real problem starts arising when the shareholders start correct catching up to uh how bad their next quarter is going to look yeah and then the market starts retaliating against these, these guys companies. are going to start hearing on earnings calls. Hey, so how are you going to deal with the SAG strike? And previously, when they got the question about the writers go strike, they say everything's fine. We have a lot of stuff in production. It's going to be wrapped up pretty soon. Don't worry about it. This is going to be a lot.
lot harder now that two unions are on strike. Um, they're going to say, oh, don't worry, we're still shooting this or that. And the shareholders are going to be like, fucking bullshit you are. No, you're not, you know. And their stock price is going to start to be affected. Those, those uh, you know, the actual money people are going to start getting mad at them. Why are you playing such hardball with your own workforce? The celebrities who you are fucking selling to the public, why are you going to war with them? And that's going to cause them to come back to the table. Now, the, the interesting thing is they're going to, each company is going to feel that separately. And so the ones that are feeling the most pressure are going to start going like, why am I fucking letting Ted Sarandos dictate my timeline? And they're going to call one of the other CEOs and be like, why don't we just go talk to the Writers Guild? And then they'll talk to two or three more and then maybe they'll start breaking apart. And that's when we win because then we impose terms on the ones that are more desperate. And then those terms we impose on the other ones that come later. Well, these three agreed to it. So now you have to too. And that's how we turn pattern bargaining uh, against them. And that's uh, that's the way we're going to win. I don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, that, that I leave up to our extremely talented staff. We have a chief negotiator and, and a bunch of other folks who like spend literally their entire careers learning how to help workers win in this situation. And this to them is like what they have been preparing 15 years to do. And so they're they're just kicking fucking ass and they're some of the coolest people I have ever met. Um, if you really want to be inspired, meet someone who works for a union. Um, they are some of the most incredible people on the planet. Here is Barbie. No, I very much in support of all the unions. It's a job like any other and actors like other workers can join the union. My union is Actors' Equity, which is part of the Media Alliance, which covers performers and journalists and well, anyone working in media and entertainment. Sometimes issues come up with our pay slips. And I think she shot this for Equity, I assume. Yeah, this looks like an industrial film made yeah. for Equity, where she's like explaining what it is. Um, That's is crazy. It, is it uh, the U.S. Actors' Equity? I'm unclear on that. No, this is she's Australian, so yeah. I assume maybe they have it both in the yeah. U.K. and Australia. Yeah. Bad dinkum. Most, mo almost every entertainment union not in the U.S. is a lot weaker than the U.S. unions. Uh, for I just found reasons. out the second she's Aussie. Are you fucking serious? Come on. Really? You didn't know she was Australian? I always assumed, at, you know, after seeing her Wolf of Wall Street, she was from Long Island. You know what I mean? The thing is, I just... Mom my is so tired of wearing panties. My assumption is that every actor that's, like, super hot is Australian until I'm proven otherwise. <laughs> like, it's a good assumption. Yeah. Is it gonna say every oh, every British, yeah. super hot actor and actress is Australian? Yeah, yeah, they grow them big out there. I don't know how the fuck it works. I don't know how it, it happens to be that way, but it is that way. Aussie unions are much stronger than the U.S. First of all, he's talking about actors unions. Yeah, actors he's not talking about regular trade unions. Yeah. He's talking about actors unions. Yeah. SAG after is a fairly powerful union. Well, and that's because you know uh, uh, the the strength of a union is often uh, aligns with the overall market power, like labor power of their workforce, and since SAG SAG-AFTRA represents the most sought-after actors and the most highly trained actors, and the Writers Guild represents, you know, it, it was just where do you say that? Because like I up, haven't upper been, echelon, they haven't reached out to me. It's <laughs> odd. It, mean, it means the union has more has more structural power. It doesn't mean you can't organize your way around lack of structural power. Like like Unite Here is a union that represents again all these low-paid uh, uh, hospitality workers, and they've managed to organize their way into having tremendous power. But there's a measure of structural power that comes from representing all these celebrities, and that, that's the main thing that I meant. I'm not like talking shit about any other union it's just because the united states has this extremely mature valuable media industry we end up having the stronger strongest unions as well and because we've fought to protect them for the last hundred years let's see what else stuff um and over time there's just technical overtime. things that for someone who's new to acting you don't know what what it's about or what you're actually entitled to and being a part of the union oh, i can I'm then go to our union representative who is alan fletcher at work dr carl and um, just make sure that I'm not being ripped off. And it's good to know that there are things they should be abiding by and stuff we are entitled to to make sure we get correct pay or breaks or overtime. Just don't don't be afraid to ask and kind of not, well, sort of demand your rights because you do have them. And I know how it feels when you're new and you're starting a job and you're at the very bottom of the pecking order. I've been in the position where I've been too nervous to ask because I don't want to cause a fuss. But um, if I knew that I was actually entitled to those, things I, it would have been a lot easier to sort out at the time it's really easy now that I'm a union member I all I have to do is call up actors equity or send them an email even if it's just a, a trivial question they're still there to answer and they have all the answers and sometimes if you're younger you feel like it's not your place to ask or, or bring up something but you have rights like everyone else and you should stand up for them
I mean, th- this is why she's standing with us now is because she had this experience when she was in the, uh, you know, her early stages of her career, like being in a union and seeing what it did for her, you know, and, and understanding like, oh, yeah, this is this is what protects me. And, and is this the correct place to donate, by the way? Uh, it is correct. Yep. Entertainment Community Fund. And you want to make sure you're donating on the page that says support film and television workers. There's a separate page for um, performance, like live performance workers. Um, but this is the one. And uh, yeah, this this is this is essentially a mutual aid fund. The fund that you do this is. It's a hundred-year-old charity, but the, uh, the the money that you donate to it will uh, go directly to uh, uh, folks who are affected. Like, if people who have worked in the entertainment industry for, I believe, a minimum of three years, they apply to this if they're on hard times, and they'll give you a grant. I think the grants are $10,000 if you say, I'm having trouble paying my rent or et cetera. Um, and we've raised, the Writers Guild has raised, like, I believe over $2 million for this fund at this point, but a bunch of people have been chipping in, and it's been incredibly impactful. Uh, really appreciate folks for for doing that. And, and, like, literally, what was really crazy was, you know, Deadline, two days ago had that article that said that the studio's end game was to make us lose our apartments and homes yeah and there was such an outpouring of support people were like where can i help and then literally we heard from the entertainment community fund oh my god there's like a surge of donations what happened and we're like, it was the fucking deadline article so the 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 boss's strategy of threatening to take away our homes guess what that that bit them bit them because the public was revolted and supported us in enormous numbers matt damon had another interview in the same carpet where deadline was quoted him where he talked about healthcare and how residuals get them on the threshold the people who are kind of on the margins and you 26,000 bucks a year is what you have to make to get your health insurance and and there are a lot of people who residual payments are what carry them across that threshold and 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 if if those residual payments dry up so does their health care and that's absolutely uh unacceptable we, we can't have that so we got to figure out something that that Really weird, because, like, I mean, he's Mr. People's History of uh, the United States by Howard Zinn on the one hand, and then he's also Mr. NFT on the other. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I mean, he, yeah, what was it? He, like, said a slur or something to his daughter and then revealed it publicly for no fucking reason. <laughs> yes, he was like. He's such a he weird. Like, I said a slur, and I feel bad. I remember this. I think Matt Damon is, a, is, is you know, a very interesting guy and great. He's, uh. He's had his missteps, but when you see when you've seen a guy this many years, you can't help but try to see him as a full person. You know, this is a wonderful statement, and it and I, it, it puts a point in Matt Damon good guy good guy category for me. I mean, the F slur is uh, he's from Boston, right? <laughs> well, if we go excusing everyone from Boston, we're gonna have a problem in America. I'm just you know? saying that, like, you like know, Mark some... Wahlberg's from Boston too, and he committed a hate crime. Yeah, exactly. That's what I, yeah, no, my point stands. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> okay, you said at least he didn't kick the shit out of a Vietnamese man. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Who I later found out he didn't blind. It's almost like kind of worse because the guy was blind to begin with. <laughs> like, I don't know which one's worse. If he like hate crimed him so hard that he went blind. Or he hate crimed a blind Vietnamese man. Oh my instead. god! The weird. So the weirdest part of that story is that like a couple of years ago, Mark Wahlberg tried to get that he tried to get a pardon from the governor of Massachusetts so that he could like get a business license or something. And the guy who he attacked made a statement like, "Mark Wahlberg's not that bad. He he was just a kid at the time. And and he, was was. Like, he was. He was like he was. 17. But how? What the fuck was the?" conversation between Mark Wahlberg's people and this guy to get him to say to the governor, please give Mark Wahlberg a break. Like, that seems fucked up just to I think, ask I, the I think guy to do that. So many, I think it's been so many years, and he probably, like, yeah. he probably doesn't hate Mark Wahlberg anymore, you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, he's like, oh, well, now I've seen, you know, his movies or whatever. Sure, I guess. Now I've seen Real Steel, so... No, he wanted to be a cop, that's why he asked for a pardon? What? No. Mark Wahlberg, at the age of 64, wanted to be a cop in Boston? What? What are you saying? Here's the Hollywood face AI in action. Hollywood production is being transformed by artificial intelligence. Deep Voodoo is a visual effects company that specializes in what they call facial replacement AI. What's a funny face I should make? Like, <laughs> like. In about 30 minutes, they scanned my every expression. That was not a funny face. <laughs> she can't be an actress. Sorry. Steve, we, we news people stay in our lane, okay? Like, th- this, kind of, this kind of stuff is such bullshit. 
because the fact that they can do it in 30 minutes has no effect on it's still going to need to get round tripped to some VFX house in Korea to make it look good. This is the quick and dirty version. This is good for TikTok filters. This company has made a cool TikTok filter. It has no effect on a uh, movie workflow. And and 99% of the AI demos that you see online are just some like NFT dude in his house. They will never be used on a movie set for a movie workflow. Uh, and uh, there, there's so much transparent bullshit in uh, well, being peddled by this industry. Wait, right now. this is not even a joke. Okay. Why is Mark Wahlberg currently asking Massachusetts to clear his record of a felony assault conviction he received in 1988? Formal recognition that I'm not the same person I was the night he attacked two Vietnamese men. Okay. By the way, did you want to do you want to know something even crazier? He also threw a bunch of rocks at <laughs> black people like in the same 24 hour sequence. Jesus Christ. Like he was just like he was a mad lad. Like nobody. He he was just an unstoppable force. That's why. He he got actually arrested for yeah. it where they were like dude for even for the fucking state of massachusetts you're doing too much mac stop <laughs> it mac like he was on a fucking hate crime streak dude he was like yeah he was doing combos he's a piece of shit i mean yeah black we... children he threw rocks at black children and also called him the hard r just the least racist bostonian he dude wants to be a reserve officer with the lapd a position in which civilian volunteers perform the duty well yeah so uh, a racist guy wants to be a cop Wait, that's kind of... We let all the other racist guys be cops. That's kind of so. interesting that the LAPD was like, sorry, you can't be a you can't be a cop with a hate crime on your record. That should be the entrance exam to the LAPD. Yeah. It's like, have you committed a hate crime? Then come on in the academy. You're right, people can't change it all. Yeah, I don't think Mark Wahlberg is still doing hate crimes, dumbass. I just think it's a funny story. Stop being so fucking sad <laughs> all the goddamn time, okay? No, I, I don't think... I don't think Mark Wahlberg is currently still, like, beating up Vietnamese people on the side, okay? It's just funny for him to be like, I want my record to be exposed so I can join yeah. the racist Los Angeles Police Department. Look, I think if you committed a hate crime, like, yeah, sure, he can change. Everybody should still know that Mark Wahlberg committed hate crimes. Like, it's something well, we should know about him. Yeah, he, you know? he, did, he did that, and then the funniest thing is, like, he did that, and then, like, a year later, he was in the Calvin Klein ad, <laughs> which is wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah it wasn't, he wasn't a rough and tumble. He was a model. Yeah. yeah. Pinky doll or yes. skibbity toilet, you must choose. If I showed Adam skibbity toilet, he'd have an aneurysm before he left. What is skibbity toilet? I got five minutes. Oh, my God. This is the OG video. Dump, dump, dump. Yes, yes. This popped up. This is a Turkish guy who just like fucking yes, yes. Skibbity, is skibbity, the skibbity, percussion skibbity, master. Double, 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 double. This is all he used to do. Yasin Cenk is his name. He, like, has a belly, yeah. and he goes to different restaurants, and he does this. <laughs> so then the children saw this, or some fucking animator saw this on Gary's Mod, and decided to turn it into what is known as Keep It The Toilet. And I'm not going to show you the older ones. Actually, you know what? Fuck it. Let's start with episode one. Okay. And this has 71 million views. <laughs> like... People are fucking... Oh, it's recent. Okay. No, kids are insanely addicted to this. So there's humans living on this planet, but then the skibbity dub toilets start taking over. There's a whole story. So, look, watch. <laughs> The animation is so good on the head. Oh, that's so great. They're sitting on toilets. <laughs> <laughs> So then they start trying to fight back against the skibbity toilets. <laughs> but they can't, because the skibbity toilets are too powerful. There's a lot of them. <laughs> oh. You're laughing, but this is going to be literally... The oh, this is you're laughing, but this is going to be the future of content. This, this is all Netflix. At, David Zaslav's looking at this, is salivating. Yeah. Yeah. This 
one is a banger. So these are each one has a has a new mix too. Well, not every episode. It's yeah. like it basically turns into something completely different. This one has two hundred million views here. Like I'll, compilation. this is this is now like a future here. Yeah. We are episode twenty four. Uh, that was like episode seven. So yeah. I accelerated the story a little bit. <laughs> So then the camera guys are introduced and they start fighting back. Oh. Oh, hell yeah. Oh. This is amazing. Who made this? Some fucking random dude. <laughs> this random dude is a genius. Yeah, he's he is like, I mean, here, I'll skip it even further. I want you to understand, like, the true madness of this. The fuck boom. Yeah, this is episode forty-eight. We watched this well, yesterday. The fuck boom has eighteen million subscribers. This is like what the battle has turned into now. <laughs> Incredible. You might be wondering, wait, why is that camera guy attacking you? Also, a camera guy. Yeah. It's because they invented mind control, uh. and then they invented reverse mind control. Uh, the the camera guys did, and then the camera guys invented like a television beam that like also uh, completely renders the CBD toilets new, uh, neutral and neutralizes them. So then they are. That's the reason why the CBD toilets on this one are wearing glasses. <laughs> 